theme of today's lecture is property law in its many manifestations. And we talk about it because property law has so many social meanings and political consequences. And much of the rest of the course will draw upon the concepts that we focus on in this, uh, this course, this today's class. We want to talk about property and what it means personally, socially, politically, and economically, and how the individual property rights notion of property is really just one of many understandings that are out there. That, uh, and that property is not an absolute uh, natural right, as many claim, uh, although there's cert certainly a uh, long tradition of many people believing that. But that there are always, there have always been uh, various limitations on the individual rights uh, of, in property. And indeed, there have been many regimes, such as common property regimes and commons, which make property a secondary attribute, uh, a secondary consideration to many other concerns, like fairness, equality, and access. And then, of course, there's a special type of commons called gift economies, uh, of which indigenous cultures and free software communities and uh, blood donation communities are examples in which property is really uh, a, a very secondary concern to the, the priorities of the community. So we'll talk briefly about that, uh, those types of property regimes as well. One of the readings is Carol Rose's uh, chapter in Property and Persuasion, her 1994 book, because it gives a nice overview of some of the various theoretical schools of property law. She notes the libertarian, utilitarian-minded types who want to maximize uh, material welfare through strict individual property rights. There's the communitarians who see property as a reflection of community norms. There are liberals who see property as something that the state should regulate and redis redistribute to assure that everyone has minimal dignity. So they're more mindful of uh, of limiting certain limits on property for social purposes. But then you have uh, commoners, uh, people like Eleanor Ostrom, who see that informal social constructions of collective property, sometimes with, sometimes without the, without state sanction, is another way to organize property. And a lot of this comes down to uh, uh, property and our notions of personhood in a given society. What what is a person in a society? Is it purely an individual? Or are there certain social norms and cultural attributes to personhood? And uh, this, of course, varies from one society to another. Carol Rose sees property as a category of community norms that must always try to persuade others to accept the social, moral, and political order implied by a certain set of property rights where she puts it, property as narrative. Uh, to quote her, property regimes cannot get over the self-interest problem without imparting some sense of a common good. So even if people are asserting uh, individual property rights, somehow that has to be justified to the broader society. Uh, and so there's a need for a property theory. Uh, there's a need for metaphors and narratives and other rhetorical devices to persuade people. Uh, Rose, Ro Carol Rose's chapter on possession as the origin of property notes that the uh, individual utilitarian notion of property is really just one narrative about property among many. Uh, that narrative, of course, is kind of commonsensical or conventional wisdom to the man on the street today. Uh, it, it echoes the notion of property that jurist William Blackstone famously put uh, as property is the sole and absolute dominion which one may claim and exercise over the external things of the world in total exclusion of the right of any other individual in the universe. Uh, in other words, it's uh, this, this individual right to exclude people that is absolute. Now, there's always been uh, important carve-outs and exceptions to those absolute individualistic claims. Uh, and some property regimes, such as the commons, uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, regard those absolute individual property rights as secondary to other concerns. Uh, but the, the, the abiding point is that any theory of property requires a moral justification or an appeal to the common good, especially if the notion of property is one that celebrates individual selfish, selfish possession. Now, uh, how, how does one make the quintessentially individualistic claim that one's possession of property for oneself is morally justified and separate from uh, the uh, common interests of everyone else? This is a, a recurrent debate in different societies, and it's at the heart of advocacy for the commons, that there are certain collective interests that must trump the claims made for private property. Now, many discussions of property theory understandably start with John Locke, who in the 17th century was trying to assert a theory of property ownership to justify individual sovereignty. Uh, he was essentially was trying to find a reason to escape the historical obligations that feudalism imposed on property owners. Uh, the lords of the manor had many uh, moral and social obligations uh, to their vassals, and the vassals, the people who tilled the land, uh, the peasants, had their own obligations to the lord of the manor. Uh, military service, giving money when their daughter was married, uh, tilling the fields and giving portions of the crop, and so forth. So, uh, Coming out of medieval times, people like Locke and many others uh, who were starting to pioneer the development of markets were quite interested in, in finding justifications for such individual property rights. Locke saw private property as a means for preventing and withstanding the abuses of authority by government as well. Uh, and he, another premise he had, which uh, was quite understandable at the time, but maybe a little suspect today, was that uh, nature is something to be dominated and developed, not something that might be ruined by technology and development and absolute property rights. Locke saw nature as something that was apart from man and needed to be dominated. So uh, despite those limitations, Locke's notions of property have really become the bedrock of Western modern thinking of what property rights ought to be. He focused on the individual and what has come to be known as the labor theory of entitlement to property. Locke said that if you uh, mixed your labor with the property, be it land or some other resource, that was what entitled you to your individual property right. Uh, this labor theory of value has proven to be very durable and understandably uh, an important notion of fairness because it's been a way that uh, we could have a theory of property rights to assert a certain individual fairness and help develop things materially. Capitalism required such a notion. Uh, it, it allowed, by having this notion, it allowed people to uh, it encouraged investment in innovations and material growth and trade. And it also provided a certain s social stability because people could understand such rules and uh, make investments built around it. Uh, so this commercial ethic, uh, which originally was really uh, more meant to escape some of the constraints of feudalism, has grown in to be uh, a founding uh, a foundational theoretical premise of property today. But there are, of course, some, some problems with this notion because, for one thing, it's not always clear what constitutes property rights. What should be the scope of one's rights from one's individual labor? As a theoretical matter, it makes sense, but uh, many, many things that we create uh, have a lot of hands participating in it. And it's not always clear who if that only one individual was responsible and therefore is entitled to property rights. Uh, so where do you draw the line between uh, your, your contributions and, say, that of a previous owner? This has been an especially vexing issue in intellectual property and copyright and patent issues. Uh, who, who is the individual who created it? Uh, 
Well, that truly, as we'll see, is one of the limitations of Locke's uh, theoretical structure. It puts such a premium on the individual that it has to go to great lengths to deny that there are collective or social or intergenerational uh, contributions to material well-being and, and property. Uh, so this is something we need to be mindful of with Locke. Another is his theory of property contains a hidden theoretical contradiction. Uh, he says that an individual is entitled to a resource if he labors to develop and improve it, yet there must also be, quote, enough for all in common. So he, there's a tension that one should be able to mix one's labor and appropriate that resource. That gives you entitlement. But there has to be enough for all. And uh, as we see in today's world, many resources are quite finite. And they're what economists call rivalrous. If I use it, you can't use it. So this uh, element of Locke's theory is often ignored by contemporary commentators who, for their own political or ideological reasons, like to focus on the individual entitlement and just sort of forget about the idea of enough for all in common. And it's, it's chiefly because Locke is using a, a kind of fictional, ahistorical, abstract example um, and not something that's really more rooted in um, a more empirical base. Well, this context helps clarify uh, Garrett Hardin's uh, famous essay on the tragedy of the commons, which accepts many of the premises of Locke's uh, theory of property and uh, takes it to actually some further extremes. Uh, Hardin sees property as a utilitarian tool which individuals over which individuals should have maximum freedom. Uh, but he, he denies the existence of meaningful communities who can work together with trust and reciprocity and, and communication to develop rules. Hardin insists upon a prisoner's dilemma arrangement in which no one can communicate with each other, uh, develop relationships of trust, devise ways to protect the commons. And so under Garrett Hardin's famous metaphor, a, a tragedy results. There is an over-exploitation and ruin of the commons. And this is virtually inevitable because indiv individuals are pursuing their rational self-interest by exploiting the commons as much as they can. In actual practice, of course, this does not occur in many, many societies uh, where people do get together and say, we're going to ruin this resource unless we find a way to restrain ourselves uh, individually and work collectively. There's no question that the tragedy of the commons can occur and frequently does occur. But it's also true that it's not inevitable the way many conservative activists and economists seem to regard the, the uh, tragedy dynamic. Uh, there are ways to solve the commons problem. And uh, Eleanor Ostrom, for, for example, the recent Nobel Prize winner in economics, has devoted much of her life to showing empirically and with lots of empirical study how a commons can be successfully managed and the tragedy of the commons averted. Now, it's important to pause here and remember that property theories are not some abstract thing that uh, maybe are amusing to academics but really don't have consequences. Property theories have many severe, profound political consequences. And one example that comes to mind that helps illustrate this in a very vivid way is the so-called Dawes Severalty Act of 1887. Now, this was a law that Congress passed to try to uh, assimilate Native Americans into the American covenant and make them citizens. Uh, one could see it either as a benign act, as uh, many members of Congress uh, portrayed it at the time, or one can see it as really an act of destruction of Indian culture by forcing them to give up their collective management of their land. What the Dawes Act did was broke it broke up tribal holdings and gave individual Indians deeds to private plots of land. And forever after that, Indian lands could not be legally owned and managed collectively uh, 
but only in severalty by individuals, as, as the law put it. it. The Dawes Act made the land alienable, that is, a saleable commodity, as opposed to something that the community held in trust for each other and in perpetuity for future generations. Now, by requiring the Indians to be, uh, give up their collective land, make it individual property as a precondition of U.S. citizenship, it uh, essentially remade Indian culture and decimated it. Uh, it was in the name of self-improvement, the self-reliance of the Indians, the civili civilizing of the uh, so-called barbarians that they were Indians were portrayed as. But it meant that uh, managing their lands as commons, as they had historically done for generations, was un-American and illegal. Uh, essentially, Congress wanted to drive home the point that to be a U.S. citizen, you had to have private alienable property individually held and not collectively asserted. And this is uh, revealing for how private property regards personhood. It decreed that uh, Indians could not be persons as American culture and law regarded it unless they gave up their collective management of their land. Uh, and uh, this had some really devastating consequences because it, it really did not turn Native Americans into fine upstanding entrepreneurs and American property holders the way American mythology might have put it. It basically allowed speculators, railroads, and other settlers to buy their surplus land, so, so called. And uh, after passage of the Dawes Act in 1887, some 86 million acres or 60% of the land that the Native Americans had once held was lost to them. And uh, they essentially became dispossessed by being forced to uh, adopt this other notion of property. Now, one, a book that I really find amusing and entertaining and instructive about uh, property law and its kind of abs uh, occasional absurdities is uh, Slide Mountain or the Folly of Owning Nature by Theodore Steinberg. And this, the, the title of the book comes from a Mark Twain short story called Slide Mountain, in which uh, a farm on a mountain was loosened by the rain and water and slid down the mountain and fell on somebody else's land. And the question that then, uh, the dispute that then ensued was, who owns this land? The, the original uh, farm owner whose, whose land all fell somewhere else or the, uh, the farm on which it fell. And it's an amusing farcical story, but it does drive home the point that property rights in nature is often a very artificial thing and uh, kind of silly, uh, yet we persist in it. So this book by Theodore Steinberg has a, Berg has a number of chapters which explores the absurdity of owning property, uh, asserting property rights in land because nature is always changing quite dramatically. So for example, uh, there was a case of uh, a sedimentary island at the bend of a river where the river deposited all this uh, soil and sediment and built up the island, but over time it changed the, uh, and, and moved the island. So can one have a stable legal title in that sort of, uh, that sort of land? Or there were the, there's another chapter about uh, ownership of airspace over Grand Central Terminal in New York and elsewhere in Manhattan, where uh, real estate holders can actually own rights in airspace, meaning the right to develop skyscrapers over otherwise vacant land. There's also a chapter about farmers who uh, tried to pursue claims of against companies that purport to make rain. So it, it's uh, it's a educational and amusing book about some of the ways in which property rights have been used to try to uh, assert individual monetary ownership in aspects of nature. It's worth going back to somebody like Thomas Jefferson, who 
had the notion of property as being an important foundation for civic republicanism, as he put it, meaning that uh, owning property has is something that contributes to to one's social uh, and political character. Uh, he famously said, "The earth belongs in usufruct to the living." Usufruct being the fruits, uh, renewable fruits of the land. What he meant was that society creates property rights. It's not a natural right that persists without regard to society. Um, nor did he see property as an end in itself to be defined by individuals as they saw fit, but it was the foundation for a strong, uh, stable Republican government, small r Republican government. It was important to building uh, civic character and uh, creating uh, a class of he wanted a class of yeoman farmers who would have property rights and then be able to participate uh, in a, in asserting and developing and debating the common good. So, uh, as uh, historian J. G. A. Pocock puts it, the citizen possessed property in order to be autonomous, and autonomy was necessary for him to develop virtue or goodness as an actor within the political, social, and natural realm or order. He did not possess it in order to engage in trade, exchange, or profit. Indeed, these activities were hardly compatible with the activity of citizenship. This, of course, was in the 17th and 18th century. But what be started to happen in uh, the 19th century was that property rights began to be regarded um, as something for commercial, advancing commercial interests more aggressively, and that the, uh, the kinds of affirmative responsibilities to the larger community that uh, Jefferson saw property owners having was starting to fall away. And a commercial ethic of property law began, began to take root and uh, gain more adherence. This, this is, in fact, the tradition that has uh, matured and reached some rather appalling states in the, uh, since the, over the past generation as the Chicago School of Economics, people like Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher have pushed property rights to such absolute individualist ex extremes that Mar Margaret Thatcher was once moved to say, there is no society meaning there are only individuals. It's this really extreme notion of property uh, having no obligations to the community. Now, again, Carol Rose has some uh, wonderful thinking on this theme. She has a, a chapter in her book, Property Persuasion, called The Comedy of the Commons, which is a wonderful essay uh, that's kind of a, could be twinned with Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons essay because it asserts the reasons for which the unorganized public might have uh, a moral justifications in owning property. Uh, you know, why, she, she wants to assert why the public has rights in property. And uh, a key landmark in uh, this whole theme was a 1892 Supreme Court case called Illinois Central Railroad versus Illinois. Now, what had happened is the uh, Illinois legislature had given away some very valuable land on the edge of uh, Lake Michigan to the railroads. And uh, they had authorized essentially what had been private uh, public land to be privately owned. But the U.S. Supreme Court in its ruling declared that the land belonged to the public and that the government was just a trustee for it, and that legislator, legislators could not alienate the public's property. And this led to uh, a, a legal doctrine that is known as the public trust doctrine, which uh, has been a key body of, of uh, court-developed law, it, sometimes with statutory sanction, uh, that gives the public access and ownership uh, at least access and sometimes outright ownership of uh, land that borders lakes, rivers, beaches, uh, oceans, so that the public can use them. Now, originally the public trust doctrine 
had a lot to do with navigable waterways, meaning uh, commerce and boats being able to use rivers and lakes so that uh, things could be transported to market. Uh, this was important because uh, if you couldn't have access to those to waterways, commerce couldn't proceed and private property owners could stop all sorts of important uh, trade. Uh, Carol Rose likes to think that uh, one reason for the public trust doctrine was to present pr protect what she calls the comedy of the commons, meaning that the more people who participate uh, in using this public resource, the more value is created. In this case, by having riverways, navigable riverways and, and um, water lakes open to er everyone, more trade can occur, more material progress can occur, and this produces not a tragedy of the commons, but a comedy in, a class, in the classical sense of a happy outcome. Now, she is trying to make the point that there is some property that is inherently public, just as the Romans uh, in, in their time had explicit legal categories to recognize public property. And uh, that there was a compelling reason for protecting public access to roads and waterways because it creates what economists would call positive externalities. Uh, the more people who have access to the resource, the more value is created, just as the internet creates more value by having everybody having uh, non-discriminatory access to it and no individual or company can exclude people from it. Um, as Rose put it, private owners were not to be permitted to capture the rents of commerce itself. In an old Lockeanism, the public deserved access to these properties because publicness, non-exclusive open access, created their highest value. The publicly created rent established a public entitlement to access. Now, a lot of this um, didn't maybe have that economic logic behind it originally. A lot, uh, public access to private property was sometimes uh, uh, an outgrowth of custom. During medieval, medieval times, for example, uh, a community frequently had used the, uh, the Lord's property for Maypole celebrations or other uh, festivities. And this was a customary right of commoners that uh, early courts often determined that the manor had to uphold that a private property owner could not override certain deeply rooted traditions of custom. Uh, as, as Rose put it, custom suggests a route by which a commons may be managed, a means different from ownership either by individuals or by organized governments. The intriguing aspect of customary rights is that they vest property rights in groups that are indefinite and informal yet nevertheless capable of self-management. Custom can be the medium through which an informal group acts. Indeed, the community claiming customary rights was in some senses not an unorganized public at all, even if it was not a formal government either. Rose, Rose continues saying, the very concept of a customarily managed commons suggests that under some circumstances, property may be more valuable as a commons than it would be in, in individual hands because the administrative costs of customary management are low relative to those of an individual property system. But her basic point, which I think is uh, worth reflecting on today, is that custom is a medium through which a, a seemingly unorganized public can organize itself and act and uh, in many contexts, even speak with the force of law. Uh, I suppose a very germane, uh, relevant uh, analog in modern times is the custom that prevails on the internet. Uh, that there's a certain social sanction and legitimacy that comes if everybody is doing it. Um, and law takes on a different meaning if uh, if so many people are doing it and it has to be taken into account. It can't be purely overridden by legislatures which at least in our times are often uh, corrupted by uh, 
campaign financing and corporate lobbies. Now, it's worth uh, talking briefly about the takings movement, which uh, is a, in the past generation, has especially picked up steam, which is challenging many notions like public trust doctrine and uh, attempts to assert community interest in private property. The takings movement cites the Fifth Amendment's just compensa compensation clause, which as a constitutional matter requires that the government uh, compensate any property owners from whom property is taken for public uses. And th th this was inspired uh, by practices during the Revolutionary War in which the British would seize private property for use in the war effort. And uh, the founding fathers wanted to uh, prevent this type of abuse in the future. Uh, but nowadays, the, sometimes the takings movement is called the so-called wise use movement. They've claimed a much broader application for the compensation, just compensation clause and the Fifth Amendment, uh, ignoring its plain language and any pretense to a strict construction of the Constitution. Uh, they, for example, are trying to prevent government uh, laws that prohibit building on wetlands or that try to protect fragile breeding grounds for migratory birds who may be on the endangered species list. Uh, the uh, takings movement wants to sanction nearly absolute property rights for landowners and to cripple the government's ability to protect the environment. And they, they essentially are seeking to cast nature as simple private property uh, and to uh, uh, shirk any obligations to protect the ecosystem or the community. Now, they will, of course, say that prop private property owners uh, will have the incentives to protect the ecosystem because it's their, their property. But of course, in practice, we know this is not often the case, that many property owners are simply investors who will exploit whatever the land has to offer and then uh, sell it and move on. Uh, and many of the Many, much of the harm is externalized, not just on their property, but on other people's property in the meantime, so that the economic consequences may not accrue to the property holder. So this is an important, um, I can't, uh, don't have the time to get into it at any great length, but the takings movement is a significant challenge to uh, the notion that the community has interest in private property, and it's uh, an ongoing struggle to see whose notion of property uh, and the uh, whose notion of personhood and whose notion of what nature is all about will prevail. It's it's a it's a theme that we would do well to consider in the context of indigenous peoples, where uh, in a wonderful essay by Brad, Bradley Bryan in the Canadian Journal of Law and Jurisprudence. He talks about uh, property as ontology, meaning being, being in our relationship to others and nature. Uh, he tries to broaden our understanding of property beyond our so-called commonsensical notions in the West and show that uh, in many societies throughout history, uh, especially those before the Industrial Revolution, property was an expression of social relationships uh, that organizes people to, the, to each other and to nature. And uh, it was not considered something that could be abstracted from community or nature. In Western property traditions, uh, property is uh, something that's seen as a product of our rational, technological, economic society. But in indigenous communities, it's something that is more rooted in uh, our daily lives with nature and each other. Uh, in, in other words, it's not assuming the Lockean tradition or vision of property as something uh, that we use to dominate nature, but something uh, that is integral with, man, mankind is integral with nature. Uh, or as, as, as uh, Brian puts it in his essay, land or territory is not understood in a Cartesian fashion, but rather as a landscape filled with subtle signs regarding the existence of game, the time of year, 
the passage of other tribes in the area, and the ways one understands when one is entitled to be there, both by nature and others. So he cites, for example, the potlatch rituals, which uh, many uh, Native American communities in the Pacific Northwest uh, have used. And it's a way that people give away property uh, and don't hold on it. In a reversal to, of Western traditions, the most esteemed, revered leaders of the community are those who, at potlatch ceremonies, give away property and don't uh, cling and possess it privately. And it's a way, uh, in a way, to as uh, assert the uh, bonds of the community. And it's also a way that uh, leaders assert their dominance. Uh, it's it's a, by giving away certain types of property, there is an allocation of use rights to certain hunting or fishing grounds, for example, and it's a, a distributional device for those, those uh, societies. It's also a way that those societies assert their spiritual connection to the earth uh, and make a connection between that spiritual connection to the earth with their own social structure and how they organize themselves as a community. Um, but I guess the point that really deserves underscoring is that the property is not seen as objects or things that are interchangeable as commodities or something that can be expressed in a cash value. It's, uh, it's something that is embedded in the web of nature so the idea of treating property as uh, fungible or alienable, uh, let alone as a commodity, is just abhorrent because nature is very specific and particular, uh, even sacred, and needs to be treated in such terms. Uh, of course, property law in, in uh, Western liberal democracies sees property as uh, in a set of centralized universal categories which don't really exist in, in many, if not most, indigenous societies where uh, knowledge about resources, is, especially nature, is often localized and it's critical to the uh, identity and functioning of that culture. So there's much to be said on uh, contrasting indigenous cultures to the Western tradition and what it reveals about different notions of personhood and, uh, and community organization. But while it, it may be uh, comforting for some people to think that those traditions are long past and don't have any relevance for modern times, it just isn't true. Uh, the contemporary analog of many indigenous cultures uh, which I might add, uh, many of them persist uh, today in these times and are not just artifacts of history or, quote, traditional. The, the analog today in Western societies are gift economies. Now, these are economies of or communities of people in which gift exchange is a key organizing principle for how they structure themselves and, uh, and their relationships to property. Uh, they don't assert property as an individual uh, possession that is exchanged through the market through using contracts and cash. It's instead something where uh, the property, the gift, is the property actually is converted into a gift, which means it always must be shared and passed along. A gift economy can be defined as a set of moral and social commitments within a defined community that can be leveraged to create economic value and nurture the community in ways that the, simp the, the market simply cannot do. It's a, a set of reciprocal exchanges. Um, now, some good examples of that are academic communities where the community is organized by giving gifts. You know, doing a paper for a scientific uh, discipline is a contribution to the society. And one gets benefits by being a member in good standing of that gift economy. And over time, you'll get access to other information and resources and advice and recognition that uh, is quite different from the way a market might operate. There are many sets of gift economies in our world today. We often don't name them that, but one can think of community gardens where various members of the neighborhood will 
collaborate in creating a shared resource or free software, open source software communities where, uh, again, there's no money changing hands in the creation of the resource and its maintenance, uh, but people contribute as their talents and time permit and they get recognition and respect in return and shared access to the resource, provided the gift economy can find a way to protect that resource from the uh, appropriation or expropriation of the market economy, which is a recurrent uh, issue and theme. Now, gift economies can be really potent and effective organizing tools for creating value. Uh, it is sometimes confounding to economists and sometimes dismaying for them to think that the rational self-interest through the cash economy is not the only way to create value, but it's true. One can see it most vividly on the internet where you have this sharing going on all the time, be it on Wikipedia, uh, social networking communities, uh, collaborative websites and archives like the internet archives. Uh, the blogosphere is a very sharing type community where information is uh, exchanged quite freely. Um, and then of course the Linux, uh, the GNU Linux operating system, which uh, improbably tens of millions of volunteers around the world have created without any of the corporate apparatus that a traditional computer program might require. But there's also real life examples, uh, meaning physical examples, such as uh, the community, community gardens in New York City. Uh, lots of co-housing ventures uh, represent a kind of gift economy. Uh, and then you even have uh, uh, barter exchange communities, which because they're officially uh, count, uh, calculating who owes what, maybe are not strictly speaking a gift economy, because gift economies tend not to be calculative of what is owed to whom and who gave what. But they do closely resemble it because in many gift, uh, many barter exchange communities, nobody really does keep score with, uh, with the currency of who owes what. A good example is uh, time dollars, which is a system by which communities can uh, give one hour of their time in exchange for other services or goods. It's kind of a alternative economy. Blood donation systems are another kind of important gift economy. And um, what's interesting about all of these gift economies is that they elicit energies and commitments and ideals that cash and the market economy and legal contracts often cannot. They uh, elicit a sense of mutual commitment and trust they promote openness and sharing of information, uh, and they are very socially satisfying. They build community. Um, so part of the challenge, I think, is just recognizing that there are such things as gift economies and they, they deserve respect as coherent value systems, value generating systems that uh, can often outperform the market. Uh, because they have a whole, they appeal to a whole different sets, set of uh, human attributes than the market system and private property. So in that sense, uh, the gift economy is an interesting way to show, shine a light on the limited epistemology, the limited uh, framework of knowing that uh, proper, private property law as traditionally understood represents. Um, so that I think concludes uh, my some of some general thoughts on various approaches to property law in this course. Uh, the readings for this week uh, offer I think some really deep insights into the ways different ways of seeing how property functions and what kinds of personhood are implied by different theoretical constructs. We're going to find that the themes discussed in this, uh, this week's lecture are uh, played out in all sorts of different permutations in the uh, later readings of this course. Uh, we can see it in how land is dealt with, how water and air are uh, propertized, and how uh, intangible cultural works 
on the internet, be they software code or uh, textual information or music or uh, images, photo or video images, uh, how these same property principles may be applied in these different regimes, and how there are political and policy controversies over which regime will prevail because there are political consequences, political implications for how we regard uh, certain resources as property and whether we regard them primarily as property or whether we regard their property attributes as secondary or tertiary to community notions of property, uh, of, the, of the resource. Whether we regard how we treat each other and the fairness and access as more salient attributes of the resource than uh, strictly defined individual property rights. So uh, next week we will be talking about land and property.